Almost 50 years after the Apollo missions, NASA is gearing up to return humanity to the moon with its Artemis program. Artemis 1, an uncrewed mission to the moon, which is also the first in a series of increasingly complex missions, was launched on 16 November 2022 from Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39B. Propelled by a pair of solid rocket boosters and four RS-25 engines, the Space Launch System rocket reached the period of maximum atmospheric pressure within 90 seconds. After two minutes of flight, the boosters exhausted their fuel and separated from the core stage. After jettisoning the service module panels and launch abort system, the core stage engines shut down and separated from the Orion spacecraft, leaving it attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage that will propel it toward the moon. As the spacecraft made an orbit around Earth and deployed its solar arrays, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage gave Orion the push it needed to leave Earth's orbit and travel toward the moon. This maneuver, known as the translunar injection, will guide Orion close enough to be captured by the moon's gravity. The Orion spacecraft separated from the interim cryogenic propulsion stage about two hours after launch. As Orion continues on its path from Earth orbit to the moon, it will be propelled by the service module provided by the European Space Agency. The mission requires all of NASA's space communications and navigation networks to work in tandem, providing different communications and tracking service levels as Orion leaves Earth, orbits the moon, and returns safely home. The outbound trip to the moon will take several days, during which time engineers will assess the spacecraft systems and adjust its trajectory. So, what exactly is Artemis 1? Why did NASA send the Orion spacecraft toward the moon? What will happen in the next 25 days? And how will it help NASA to plan future missions to Mars? Let's answer these questions one by one. Artemis 1, formerly known as Exploration Mission 1, is the first integrated test of NASA's Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System rocket. The mission will ensure the rocket and the spacecraft can safely carry astronauts toward the moon and return them to Earth. The SLS rocket is designed to be evolvable, which makes it possible to fly more types of deep space missions. Artemis 1 uses the Block 1 configuration, which stands at 98 meters and produces nearly 42 meganewtons of thrust during liftoff. The Boeing company builds the SLS core stages, including the avionics that control the vehicle during flight. The core stage, which stands approximately 65 meters tall and has an 8.5-meter diameter, houses the cryogenic liquid oxygen and hydrogen required to fuel the rocket's four RS-25 engines. Aerojet Rocketdyne upgraded the inventory of RS-25 engines used in space shuttle missions to meet SLS performance requirements. The four engines will provide 8.8 meganewtons of thrust, approximately 25% of SLS's total thrust during liftoff. There are more missions besides Artemis 1 that use space shuttle components. The next three missions, Artemis 2 through Artemis 4, will be powered by flight-proven RS-25 engines and new engines assembled from shuttle-era components. NASA has awarded Aerojet Rocketdyne a contract to build new and expendable RS-25 engines for use beginning with Artemis 5. Two Space Shuttle-derived solid rocket boosters, each 54 meters tall, will provide the rest of the vehicle's thrust. Using Heritage Shuttle engines and boosters upgraded for SLS, the Artemis program saved the time and cost typically associated with developing new propulsion systems. The upper stage of the rocket, known as the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, is based on the Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, used on United Launch Alliance's Delta IV family of rockets. The 13.7 meters tall stage uses an RL-10 engine made by Aerojet Rocketdyne to propel Orion out of Earth's orbit. The engine is powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and generates 110 kilonewtons of thrust. NASA is also developing an exploration upper stage, which will replace the interim cryogenic propulsion stage on Block 1B and Block 2 of the SLS rocket. Named after one of the largest constellations in the night sky and drawing from more than 50 years of space flight research and development, the Orion spacecraft is the next generation spacecraft designed for the demands of human missions to deep space. Orion's crew module, sometimes referred to as the crew capsule, can provide living space for four astronauts on missions for up to 21 days. Astronauts will operate Orion using a sophisticated display and control system that uses advanced software to aid the crew. The crew module houses Orion's parachute system. A system of 11 parachutes will ensure a safe landing for astronauts returning to Earth at high speeds. The bottom of the capsule, which will experience the hottest temperatures as Orion returns to Earth, is covered by the world's largest ablative heat shield, measuring 5 meters in diameter. Orion's service module provides propulsion capabilities that enable the spacecraft to go around the moon and back on its missions. The service module has 33 engines of various sizes designed to steer and control the spacecraft. 
Orion's launch abort system is designed to carry the crew to safety in the event of an emergency during launch. In the case of an emergency, the three solid rocket motors work together within milliseconds to pull the vehicle to safety and position the crew module for a safe landing. When the Orion spacecraft was launched on the Artemis 1 mission, there was a suited mannequin dubbed Commander Munikin Campos aboard the spacecraft. The mannequin, named after the legendary electrical engineer Arturo Campos, who was instrumental in saving the Apollo 13 crew, is occupying the commander's seat on the spacecraft. The mannequin, wearing the shiny new Orion Crew Survival System flight suit, is outfitted with sensors to provide data on what crew members may experience in flight. As Orion travels beyond the protection of the Earth's magnetic field, it will be exposed to a harsher radiation environment, known as the Van Allen belts. Two identical phantom torsos named Helga and Zohar, occupying the lower two seats on Orion, will be part of a study called the Matryoshka Astrorad Radiation Experiment. The study is designed to measure the amount of space radiation astronauts may experience inside Orion. Zohar is wearing a radiation shielding Astrorad vest, while Helga does not. Additionally, Orion is equipped with a variety of equipment and experiments that will aid NASA in better understanding the radiation environment and creating adequate protection. In addition to Orion, SLS is carrying 10 CubeSats in an adapter ring that connects Orion to the SLS upper stage. Four of them are devoted to studies of the moon, including the Japanese space agency's Amatanashi, which will attempt a semi-hard landing on the moon. NASA's Lunar Ice Cube NanoSat will locate and estimate the amount and composition of water ice deposits on the moon. Three other CubeSats will study space weather and the radiation environment in cis-lunar space. Two CubeSats will conduct technology demonstrations of deep space communications, plasma thrusters, and advanced optics. NASA's Near-Earth Asteroid Scout, or NEA Scout, will attempt to deploy a solar sail that will allow it to fly by a small near-Earth asteroid. The CubeSat will capture a series of images of its target asteroid, which will be used by scientists on Earth to better understand the object. All the CubeSats will be deployed from the interim cryogenic propulsion stage during its journey to the Moon. Later the stage will be sent into a heliocentric orbit. Once it reaches its destination on November 21, the Orion spacecraft will fly about 97 kilometers above the surface of the Moon and then use the Moon's gravitational force to propel it into a distant retrograde orbit about 70,000 kilometers from the lunar surface. Distant retrograde orbit provides a highly stable orbit where little fuel is required to stay. The spacecraft will stay in that orbit for approximately 10 days to collect data and allow mission controllers to assess the performance of the spacecraft. Throughout the flight, cameras inside and outside Orion will document the view, beaming back selfies of the spacecraft and shots of the Moon and Earth. On December 1, Orion will fire its engines at precisely the right time to harness the Moon's gravity and accelerate back toward Earth. If all goes according to plan, Orion will get back to Earth on December 11. 20 minutes before atmospheric entry, the capsule will separate from its service module and orient itself so its heat shield faces the direction of travel. The capsule will then slam into the top of the Earth's atmosphere at an altitude of 120 kilometers while moving at nearly 40,000 kilometers per hour. Earth's atmosphere will slow the spacecraft down to a speed of about 480 kilometers per hour, producing temperatures of approximately 2,800 degrees Celsius and testing the heat shield's performance. Once this extreme heating phase of flight passes, the spacecraft will deploy its drogue parachutes, followed by three main parachutes, which will slow its descent to less than 32 km per hour. The spacecraft will then make a precise splashdown in the Pacific Ocean within the eyesight of the recovery ship. The expected mission duration at splashdown is 25 days, 10 hours, 53 minutes. The landing and recovery team will be responsible for safely recovering the capsule after the splashdown. Divers will attach a cable to the spacecraft and pull it by winch into a specially designed cradle inside a U.S. Navy ship's well deck. The vessel will transport the spacecraft and other hardware to appear at U.S. Naval Base San Diego for transport to the Kennedy Space Center. Artemis 1 will lay the groundwork for the next two missions in the Artemis program, Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. Artemis 2 is scheduled to send humans on a similar trip around the moon in 2024, and Artemis 3 will make history by landing astronauts on the lunar surface sometime in 2025. Even though the ultimate goal of the Artemis program is to establish a sustainable human presence on the moon, the Artemis missions will also serve as a testing ground for future crewed expeditions to Mars. If all goes as planned, NASA will shift its attention to a Mars mission sometime in the 2030s. So, are you excited about humanity's return to the moon? What do you think about the possibilities of future Mars missions? Let me know in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more space-related content.
And as always, thanks for watching.